Hi, and welcome to the simulation step up series. My name is Ramesh Lakshmipati. I'm a senior technical sales specialist with Dasa Systems Solidix Corporation. Now, in this presentation, we'll review part two of modeling pin connectors in Solidix simulation. So let's get started. Let's take a look at the simple three part assembly as illustrated. It consists of two C shaped brackets with a long pin tying them together. In the system, the, we would expect the pin to bend up under the applied load. The question is, can a pin connector model this fastener? To start off, a solid pin simulation setup was built with the actual solid pin. A 100 pound load is applied on the top part uh, on the cylindrical face shown. And on the bottom part, a fixed constraint is applied on the cylindrical face as shown here. Now, we don't want to impose any fictitious stiffness in the system. So we don't want to bond the pin to either of the parts, thus allowing for a more natural deformation. So no penetration contact was defined between all the parts, but there is no geometry that would limit the axial travel of the pin. And that's a key challenge that we need to address to ensure that we achieve numerical stability in the model. So one easy trick is to use contact friction and restrain that axial motion between the pin and the outer part and letting the inner part slide on the pin. While this might actually work, it can produce an undesired behavior since a lot here will depend upon the mesh density in the contact areas, which in turn affects the calculation of frictional forces. So unless the frictional forces exactly balance out on the opposite sides, the inner part deformation about the loading axis may not be symmetrical. The other alternative is to use soft springs in the study properties. But again, keep in mind the soft spring option should only be used to stabilize unconstrained or insufficiently constrained components especially if you don't care about what happens in those unconstrained direction. So both these options, though they seem viable, can actually end up producing, a, producing an unrealistic behavior. So our best bet here is to go ahead and use a virtual wall contact to prevent the pin from that axial translation. So this behaves as a restraint in the one desired direction of interest, and at the same time does not introduce any artificial stiffness into the system. Now with the virtual wall contact, the results from the simulation, here's what the deformation plot looks like. Again, keep in mind, this is shown exaggerated for visualization purposes, but you can clearly see a more realistic bending as expected. When the same problem is actually solved with contact friction instead of virtual contact, here's what the deformation looks like. And you can clearly see that the deformation is not symmetrical uh, about the loading axis. In addition to using a solid pin, we do have other options using a pin connector. Now, we cannot use one pin connector definition to model the entire long pin. If you select all the through holes on one part and all the through holes on the second part in the pin definition, a message is probably gonna show up as below. And basically what that means is while selecting the geometry, the faces selected in the top field selection box as well as the bottom field selection box must belong to the same part. So our alternative option is to use one pin connector per side. And again, while the holes on each side must remain concentric, the connected parts can deform independently of each other, as a real pin would do in, in uh, about its center. And to account for that behavior, we can turn on or turn off the axial translational constraint in the pin connector definition. So remember, for a single connector, each selection box must have faces only from one part. Let's take a look at each one of these scenarios. So in the first example that we have seen using the solid pin, we see a more natural response with about five thousandths of an inch displacement on the end. And this appears to be reasonable. In the second case, a pin connector is attached to each side uh, and no translation or rotation is allowed uh, on the pin connector in this particular scenario. And in the third case, we do the same uh, simulation with the pin connectors, except that the translation along the pin axis is now allowed. Now each model clearly varies in shape and response magnitude. So the question is, which one of them is correct? I would say that the only model I, would, I have confidence in is the case number one, taken individually without the benefit of seeing the others. Each case might be mistaken for a reasonable solution. However, compared 
with respect to each other, and more importantly, importantly to the solid pin, it would be hard to confidently rely on any of the connector models. So does this mean the pin connector gives incorrect results? The answer is no, when used within its guidelines. Bottom line is that the pin connectors should generally not be used to model long fastness unless certain conditions exist. So in summary, to reiterate, the more flexible the fastener, the less likely that pin connector for long fasteners will yield a predictable response. The only way to be sure is to use a test model that compares a solid pin with the idealized fastener as shown in the previous example. Now as the pin gets more stiffer or rigid with respect, with respect to the system, either through geometry or material properties, a, mat a pin connector can begin to approximate the response of a long pin. Since the internal makeup of the pin connector is rigid, this probably makes more sense. Now, switching gears for the rest of the unit, we'll take a look at how test models can be used to evaluate the effectiveness of using pin connectors for predicting pin joint failure. Here is the model inside SolidWorks. Let's go ahead and review a few scenarios. Uh, the first one is a solid pin and using a virtual wall contact condition. Just to illustrate, what I'm doing here is selecting the flat face on the pin and then using a reference plane geometry in SOLIDWORKS as the virtual wall. Now in this, in this scenario, the wall is assumed to be rigid, but then you can also make it flexible and assign different wall stiffnesses uh, in different directions if necessary. Now here's the deformation from this particular setup. Let's go ahead and animate this real quick. You can clearly see that deformation looks very realistic as expected. Let's go ahead and take a look at the scenario where instead of the virtual wall, uh, the contact friction is actually used. And here you can clearly see uh, animating the deformation shows us that the inner part tends to slide more on one side uh, towards the pin compared to the other side. In this particular setup, we have actually replaced the solid pin with the uh, virtual pin connectors. So here is a quick look at the definition of one of the pins. So here, all we're doing is selecting the cylindrical faces between the two parts and then restraining the axial as well as the rotation of that pin connector and uh, <clears throat> as simple as that. And the results of this particular setup probably mimics or, you know, it's probably more closer to the uh, one with the virtual wall and using a solid pin. But you can, can clearly see that there's, there are still some differences when it comes to the overall deformation. Failure in a pin joint will involve failure of either the fastener or of the parts being fastened. The fastener failure typically can be from the shearing through one cross section called the single shear or the shearing through two cross sections called the double shear. Or it could be a crushing failure, especially in hollow pins and rivets. Now on the bearing plate, the shearing or tearing of the plate from the hole is a common type of failure. And this can be typically avoided by placing the fastener about one and a half times the fastener diameter away from the plate edge. The crushing of the plate and the tearing between adjacent fasteners are other types of bearing plate failures. Let's examine, examine how failure in a fastener, uh, especially in a pin, is typically predicted. Now, the properly sized pins are assumed to undergo only shear loading. The machinery handbook is just one reference that lists allowable loads for a variety of fastener types. The ANSI and ASME standards have qualified certain categories of fasteners by their load carrying capabilities and tabulated these strengths. So all that, the, all that the designer needs to know is the shear loading in the pin caused by the system operation to determine if the pin is acceptable. Since it was actually discussed earlier in the presentation that the shear load as well as the bending and axial loads are provided for each pin connector, it should be very clear that determining pin acceptability using the connector output is pretty straightforward. However, some of the inherent assumptions of the connector, most importantly, the rigid restraint on the cylindrical holes, suggest that failure of the bearing plates or fastened parts local to the fastener might not, might not be reliable. 
So using simple shear models, especially the single shear and the double shear test scenarios as illustrated here, the stress results with a solid pin and a solid connector can be compared. Now looking at the results of the double shear scenario as illustrated here, we have the solid pin model on the left and the pin connector model on the right side. And we, we can clearly see this, that the stress distribution on both the inner and outer plates differs greatly with the two different joint methods. The shear force, bending moment, and the axial forces are, however, some key results output that can still be used to make sizing decisions. Switching to the single shear model, a similar conclusion can be drawn. The stresses local to the fastener are not reliably captured using the pin connector idealization, as shown here on the right side. Typically, the recommended practice is to look at results at least one or two diameters away from the pin connector location. And one neat trick is to split the body into two using a diameter one and a half to two times the whole diameter. And that way, while viewing the results, we can simply hide that solid body volume and look at the correct distributed results on the rest of the model. Here in SOLIDWORKS, I have a three plate assembly and all these three plates are held together by the solid pin as shown. I want to use this assembly to illustrate the double shear loading on the pin. So in the first scenario, the physical geometry of the pin has been accounted for in the simulation setup. Also what's happening is the top and bottom plates are fully constrained on the back and face as shown, and the middle plate, there is a tensile load of 245 pounds applied to simulate the shear load on the pin. Let's take a look at the stress distribution on the plates and the pin. Now, before I do that, I'm gonna go ahead and explode the view so that it's easier to review the results on the plates and the pin surfaces. Once I do the exploded view, I can go ahead and invoke the stress plot, and here is what it looks like. Clearly, you can see the bending effect on the pin and also the x shape profile on the whole areas. And the stress distribution itself around the whole areas seems to be realistic and as expected. In the second scenario, the physical geometry of the pin has been replaced by a couple of pin connectors as shown, but the rest of the workflow remains exactly the same. Let's go ahead and take a look at the definition of one of these pin connectors. You can clearly see that it's simple through hole selections and then specifying the connection type. In this case, the pin has no translation, it has no rotation. The stress distribution clearly shows us that the stress around the pinhole areas are not realistic, they're not as expected. But the whole idea of using pin connector is to avoid looking at the stresses at least one or two diameters away from the pinhole areas, but most importantly, looking at the loads the pin actually carries. So here, under results, I can go and look at what the loads look like on each one of these pin connectors. You can clearly see that the shear force is exactly half as expected on each one of these pins. So again, this uh, verifies the double shear scenario that we are trying to simulate here. And the axial force is minimal. There's a little bit of bending moment, uh, no torque in the system. And finally, let's take a look at the simulation results on this two plate model where the pin is actually loaded in shear as well. Now, looking at the stress distribution clearly shows that the stress around the pinhole is not so realistic. So in situations like this, it's always recommended to look at the stresses or strain at least one diameter away from the pinhole. And to make the process easier, the general recommended or the best practice is to split the body. In this case, the plate you can see is two solid bodies and one of them is representative of the volume around the pin area where the stresses or the strains are not gonna be realistic. So once I have a geometry like this and simulate the process, what I can do is I can look at the stress, but then go ahead and hide that particular body now and look at the stress again. You can clearly see that now the stresses are starting to look a little bit more reasonable, a little bit more realistic. One key thing to, to keep in mind is what I just did was 
hide a body, but to make sure the stress distribution is reflective of what I'm seeing in the graphics area in terms of the geometry, you want to go to the chart options on that particular plot and make sure the show min and max range on the shown parts only is selected. All right, so we have seen how pin connectors are a fast and reliable method for general load transfer in an assembly that has pin or riveted fasteners. The tabulated output of the connected forces like the shear, axial, and bending loads can be really useful for sizing fasteners for predicting fastener failure and it's significantly more straightforward than trying to estimate acceptability from stress or contact pressure results on a solid pin. The whole diameter really doesn't have any effect on the results. One caution with using pin connectors is that it should not be used when failure local to the fastener is a primary concern. The internal modeling methods can skew up the local stresses and displacement results around the pin and the pin holes. So one possible workflow is to model your system with pin connectors to evaluate the overall system response and optimize the base structure. Use the connector output results to ensure that the fasteners are sized correctly. And at this point in areas that warrant more detailed study, build a solid model of the properly sized fastener and use contact conditions to better determine local stresses. This gives you the best of both worlds, so as to speak. So in summary, in this edition of the simulation setup series, we review the interface and internal representation of pin connectors in SOLIDWORKS simulation. Knowing what the software is doing internally allowed us to establish a set of usage guidelines for incorporating pin connectors into assembly models. And finally, we challenged some of the assumptions with test models that allowed us to better understand the benefits and limitations of this very powerful feature. The methodology of using test models to explore new modeling techniques is an important, is as important a takeaway from this particular presentation. For more information on how pin connectors work, contact your local SOLIDWORKS reseller for a more in-depth training or support on this particular topic. Or you can always review the online help in SOLIDWORKS simulation for a more detailed description of the feature discussed today. All right. That concludes this presentation. You can watch this presentation as well as several other presentations as part of the Simulation Step Up series on the Simulation YouTube channel. I'll see you next time. Thanks and have a great day.